Hey there. We are finishing up section 9.1 in which we're learning about antiderivatives and indefinite integrals, which is a term we're going to use more frequently. And we're in the final video for this section. We are going to be working on learning goal 3 where it says you'll be able to find a particular solution of an indefinite integral. All right, a particular solution of an indefinite integral. Well, let's work on that. We're going to be doing a couple of application problems here. And I want to start off with this problem here. Let's suppose that the velocity of a moving particle is given by the formula V of t equals 6t minus 2. All right, remember we've dealt with the idea of a particle being in motion along a line before, and this is kind of the same concept right here. Where I want us to start with this is by writing a function to find the particle's position s after t seconds. Well, when we were working with the motion of a particle in a line, we said that there's a relationship between these two quantities right here, between the velocity and a particle's position. And in particular, what we said at that time was this. We said that velocity is a derivative of position. And then, of course, acceleration was the derivative of velocity. But let's focus on this, that velocity is the derivative of position. All right. But this time, we're not given the position and trying to find the velocity. We're given the velocity, and we're trying to find the position which means we've got to go backwards, or in other words, we've got to anti-differentiate. Right? If velocity is the derivative of position, that means that position is the antiderivative or indefinite integral of velocity. So, if we're going to be able to figure out what the particle's position is, or a function for the particle's position after t seconds, we're going to have to use or find the integral of this velocity function right here. So here's how that's going to work then. Position s is equal to the integral of the velocity function with respect to time. All right, so in this case then specifically, that's the integral of 6t minus 2 dt. All right, and if you follow our rules for integration, if you integrate 6t, you'd get t squared. Then you have to multiply the 6 by 1 half, you get 3t squared. And then the integral of 2 is 2t. So we're going to get the, the position is 3t squared minus 2t plus c. Now I'd like to do something here to illustrate to you what we've just found. When we said that the integral of the velocity function gave us the position function, and if that was equal to 3t squared minus 2t plus a constant value, what we were given then was what was called a general solution for the integral. And I want to illustrate that. With this graph that you see here, first of all, I want you to notice that I've got the equation of that parabola, which is really our position function, all right, 3t squared minus 2t, because I use x, had to use x's instead. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what it means to get the general solution, okay? You see the slide over here where c is equal to 0? And do you happen to notice that this function is going through the origin right now? And that there is no constant term? Well, that value of c here controls the constant term for this function. And if we're saying that there are an infinite number of constants that I could put here that would give us that same velocity function if we took its derivative? Well, that means every graph, every vertical translation of this graph would be one of the possible solutions for our position function. And it's not very good for us to have this many possible position functions to choose from, all right? How do we know which one is actually going to give us the position of our particle if we wanted to find the position of our particle at a certain time? All 
Okay, so again, the solution that we got is called a general solution because it doesn't tell us specifically what the position function is that we're looking for, but it gives us a family of position functions that are all vertical translations of one another. All right, if we're really going to be able to do anything with this problem, we're going to need some way of being able to find out what that value of C is for the particular particle that we're working with. All right, now I'm going to give you a little bit more information on this problem. Let's suppose now that the position of the particle after two seconds is known to be four, whatever units four is, millimeters, centimeters, kilometers, who knows. All right, but we know that the position of the particle after two seconds is known to be four. And then we're going to use that information to find the position of the particle after 10 seconds. All right, well, I want to show you how knowing that the position of the particle at t equals 2 is 4, how that helps us to actually be able to come up with a function that we can use in order to find the position of the particle at any time, such as 10 seconds. Let's look back at that graph. When we didn't know any extra information about the problem, such as that after 2 seconds position was 4, we said this graph could be anywhere, up or down, up or down, up or down. But now what we've done is we've introduced what's called a boundary condition. And we're saying that when t is equal to 2, that s is equal to 4. Now watch what happens. What I'm going to try to do is find out when does a graph pass through that point 2, 4. And there you go. And there is only one way for that graph to pass through that point 2, 4. And it happens to be when the constant value is negative 4. Now, I want to go back to the slide to explain that a little bit further. We have our general solution here, but as soon as we know that S of 2 is equal to 4, we have what's called a boundary condition. And what the boundary condition is going to help us to do is to find the specific position function that will tell us where this particle is after how many ever seconds we want. All right? Because what we can do now is this. We can say that S of 2 is equal to 3 times 2 squared minus 2 times 2 plus C. Let's see, that's 12 minus 4, that's 8 plus C. And we happen to know that S of 2 is equal to 4. Do you see how what this is going to allow us to do is to figure out what the constant is for this particular function? All right, well, that means we're going to get negative 4 is equal to the constant. And so we can say that the position function is no longer a general function, but it's the specific function 3t squared minus 2t minus 4. All right, that is the particular solution. All right, so often you can find problems where an integral is going to have a boundary condition, and whenever an integral has a boundary condition, you're able to figure out what the constant is for the integration, and so you can come up with a particular solution for that integration. And when you come up with a particular solution for the integration, you can play around with it and substitute various input values and see what output values you can get. In this case, what we're interested in doing is finding out where is the particle after 10 seconds, and so we can use our particular position function here in order to figure that out. We could say that s of 10 equals 3 times 10 squared minus 2 times 10 minus 4. Let's see, that's 300 minus 20 is 280. It would be at a position of 276. Excellent. 
Well, let's see if you guys can solve a problem in which you have an indefinite integral, but with a boundary condition that allows you to find a particular solution for that indefinite integral rather than just the general solutions that we've been finding so far. And here's the problem that we're going to work with. It says the rate at which the area of a circular ripple increases in millimeters squared per second is given by the dA dt equals 3t squared plus 4t for when 0 is less than or equal to t is less than or equal to 8. All right, going to go through this a little bit. We're looking at the rate at which an area increases. All right. And these are just the units for that rate of change. It's how, what is the area per second that's changing, and this area is measured in millimeters squared. And you see that the rate is given by this equation right here. All right. Now, the initial area of the ripple is 3 square millimeters. We're going to use that fact to find the area of the ripple when t is equal to 5. All right, now it's always a good thing to look at what it is you're ultimately trying to find. In this case, we're trying to find an area. And if you're trying to find an area, you need some kind of function that can help you calculate the area of whatever you're finding the area for. All right, so how are we going to go about finding a function for the area when all we have is a function that says how quickly the area is increasing? All right, now I'm going to need you to think about what you know about derivatives. And why are we working with derivatives here? Well... Isn't that rate of change given by dA dt? Remember that the first derivative of a function tells you when the function is increasing and when it's decreasing? And so anytime you're talking about a rate of change, well, you're talking about the derivative of a function. So the rate at which the area changes would be the derivative of the area function. And that means this. that we can find the area function by finding the integral of dA dt. All right, so let's continue that. Actually, I'm going to write one more step and then ask you to pause and, and figure the rest out on your own. But, all right, we're going to say that the area function you can get from finding the integral a 3t squared plus 4t dt alright now you need to go ahead and finish this integration and you need to find a particular solution for this indefinite integral and once you find that particular solution using a boundary condition that's given to you then you can find the area of the ripple using that area function that you determine all right, try it out. Okay, so your general solution should have been this, that the area is given by t cubed plus 2t squared plus c. But then you were going to use the boundary condition, which is that the initial area of the ripple is 3 square millimeters. Now that means this that a of 0 is equal to 3. All right, now we're going to do two things here. We're going to replace t with 0, and we're going to replace a with 3 at the same time. Let's just get it all done at once. So we can say 3 is equal to 0 cubed plus 2 times 0 squared plus c. And so that tells us our constant of integration. That's really what that c is referred to as. The constant of integration is 3. And so our particular solution for the area is t cubed plus 2t squared plus 3. And then all we have to do is plug in 10 for t. Oh, not 10. Don't know where I'm getting that from. We're trying to find the area when the ripple, or other ripple 1 over t is equal to 5. In fact, the domain does not even include 10, does it? All right. Anyway, we're going to plug in 5 for t. And I'm assuming you've already done that at this point. And so you figured out that the 
area that ripple after five seconds is 178 square millimeters. All right, that's find a particular solution of an indefinite integral using a boundary condition. We're done with section 9.1. We'll see you in the next video.